Welcome, and thank you for joining us for the 71st annual Man and Woman of the Year. We are so happy to be able to connect with you tonight and celebrate outstanding community leaders who are putting Arizona first. You'll see me throughout the evening, here and there, both live and recorded, and we'll finish the evening live with Jack McCain. I know you're not tuning in to hear me speak, so we're gonna get right to it. But first, I wanna thank our supporters who made tonight possible. Our Principles of Doing sponsor, who is presenting Man and Woman of the Year, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Arizona. Our Building Trust sponsor, BOK Financial. Our Integrity sponsor, Fries. Our Arizona First sponsors, APS, the Arizona Republic, Cox and Robeson Communities. Our Team Mindset and Driven To Do sponsors, whose name you'll see on your screen. Thank you all for making tonight possible. At Valley Leadership, we focus on providing leaders the tools to learn and to take action. And we do that strategically so they can work together to address the most pressing issues facing Arizona. Tonight, you'll meet our alumni who are working to make our community stronger through our Impact Maker. You'll also get to know our Man and Woman of the Year honorees, Ken Schutz and Karen Taylor Robeson. And finally, we'll talk with Jack McCain and celebrate his father, Senator John McCain, with our inaugural Person of the Decade Award. You'll hear great stories along the way. Please share them with your network on social media. Be sure to use our event hashtags and tag VL. After all that, we hope you'll be inspired to find a way to get involved or support our work. And did I mention we'll get back to you, we'll get you back to your evening in under an hour? Let's do it. First, I'd like to welcome our presenting sponsor, Pam Kahali, CEO of Blue Cross Blue Shield of Arizona. Hello, and thank you, Dave. Blue Cross Blue Shield of Arizona is proud to partner with Valley Leadership because we're both committed to improving the lives of Arizonans. This year has been challenging to say the least, and I want to thank you all for staying home today and so many days before to keep Arizonans safe. Our hospitals and healthcare professionals have been courageous, compassionate, and innovative in how they have cared for Arizonans through this pandemic. I want to thank them for their hard work and sacrifice through this really uncertain time. I think you'll all agree they've all taught us a very valuable lesson, and that is we accomplish so much more when we work together toward the same goals. Tonight, I know you'll meet others who have taken that same approach in how they lead, always putting Arizona and the people who call this great state home first. Thank you for being here. We look forward to celebrating tonight with you. Pam, thank you and Blue Cross Blue Shield of Arizona for your continued partnership and leadership when it comes to Arizonans' health. Also, thank you, Sue Glaw, longtime supporter of Valley Leadership and this event. Enjoy your many years of retirement ahead of you, Sue. They are well-deserved. So, we have all been looking for ways we can help and lead during this crisis, and that has been true for our impact maker teams as well. Remember the VL pivot? Well, a big part of that is the impact maker. So what is it again? It's an intentional collective of VL alumni, community champions, and organizations who together strategically work on solutions that make a difference now and in the long run for Arizona. And while the pandemic may have moved most of our team meetings online, the silver lining is that COVID-19 has reinforced our purpose to make systemic change on the most pressing issues facing Arizona. Let's catch up with the alumni who are leading through Impact Maker. All right, let's meet the alumni who are powering our Impact Maker. We have uh, joining us today, Clint Houston, who's the chair of the COVID-19 Impact Team. We have Aaron Hart, who chairs our Education Impact Team. Mary Foote chairs our Jobs and Economy Impact Team. Janine Bashir leads our Child Wellbeing Impact Team. And Dr. Nick Vasquez chairs our Health Impact Team. So we're gonna do a little bit of round robin here with all of you, and I just want you to each give us a description of your team and what you're uh, tackling. What are you working on? Let's start with Erin. The education team is working to ensure every child in Arizona receives an excellent education that prepares them for future success in life. We came together in March just to see what we could do to help out with the pandemic and it grew from there to several strategies and to do items. 
We're committed to helping students understand high impact career pathways. We want to build a strong homegrown talent pipeline in Arizona, particularly in those high demand sectors. Well, Bean Team is working to ensure all of Arizona's children are safe, supported, and thriving. We're working um, to support both children and families that are both involved in the child welfare system and those families that are not. Well, the health team, we're focused on making sure Arizonans have good health and live in a healthy community. Great. Love the work. So let's uh, go again and see uh, what impact has your team made so far? What are some wins and who you've been working with? The education team has been working on improving early literacy rates and post-secondary attainment. We're working on two projects for early literacy. One is a short-term project in response to COVID-19. Um, with many schools and libraries being closed, we want to make sure that, that at-risk students had access to books. And so we've been able to um, gather 2,500 2, books from people all across the valley and restock over 110 little free libraries in high needs areas. We're also working on a longer term project to build more little free libraries to put them in neighborhoods across the valley as well. And for post-secondary attainment, our team built a toolkit focused on how to fill out requests for the FAFSA for students, counselors, for companies who wanna help grow their workforce for the future. And we're also working on a communications campaign to support FAFSA completion in Arizona. Initially, we were in triage mode. We were looking for gaps in the community and seeing where we could get protective equipment and sanitation supplies out to uh, those that needed it on the front line. Um, we also worked with the state of Arizona to create a guide for those experiencing the sudden unemployment. And soon we'll have a white paper out that we'll be showing to the legislators. Well, the health team is focused on two areas so far. Uh, first, increasing access to healthy foods, and the second, reducing the stigma that has contributed to Arizona's opioid crisis. For healthy foods, we're working with Fresh Connections to harvest, pack, and distribute fresh produce to over 200 families a week. To reduce the stigma that has contributed to the opioid crisis and prevents people from treatment, we've partnered with business communities to create a website to help companies reassess the policies to support employees who may be struggling with substance use disorder. Our work is focused on connecting with the child well-being organizations and the current work that's being done in the field. Um, we believe this will help um, improve collaboration and eliminate any type of duplication of efforts. To date, we've been able to identify three systems partners to support and work collaboratively with. Um, they are the court appointed advocates that are known as CASA, um, the DCS Youth Council, which focuses on working with youth, youth that are in the foster care system. Um, and we're also working with the governor's office um, in a collaborative effort. What is your team's long-term goal and why is that goal important to you personally? Uh, we, we'd like to take what we've learned uh, from the gains we've made in the short term and figure out how we can apply those to new systems that can go into place to address future crises. Our long-term goal is that we want to see systems change. We want to see a child well-being system that's working collaboratively together. Um, we want um, a better health and well-being system for Arizona's children. Um, we owe this to our children. I think, you know, we, we sometimes forget that these are the same children that will one day sit in our own seat and they will make decisions on be our behalf. So we owe it to them to get it right. I want to thank each and every one of you for all your hard work and leadership over the past year and a half as we've gotten these first five teams off the ground. Very excited about the work. I know you guys have put in a ton of hours uh, we appreciate it. Arizona appreciates it and the long-term uh, systemic change you're going to bring to it. So thanks again. And uh, now let's get back to the show. These are big challenging issues and they won't be solved by one person or one organization or overnight. We have countless leaders who have invested hundreds of hours over the past year to kickstart this evolutionary and revolutionary model of tackling issues. I wanna thank all our Impact Maker team leads, members, contributors, funders, and strategic partners for their work. And there's always more work to do. We plan to announce at least two more Impact Maker teams before the end of the year in the areas of racial justice and the environment. So stay tuned. Now, let's get to our honorees. First up, please welcome our 71st Man of the Year, Kenneth Schutz, the Executive Director of the Desert Botanical Garden.
All right, you ready? Let's be good. You ready? Watch the steps, let's go, let's go. So the most challenging part of my day is that there's not enough time to do everything that is a part of my day. My day job is, is very people oriented. The biggest sources of inspiration for me, the, the single biggest one is the beauty of nature um, and the need to intervene and stop destroying so much of it. And I just feel this really strong sense of urgency that if we don't act in a strong way and a quick way, we're gonna lose things forever. Um, I am, a, as you know, the garden director. I love plants, but it, it won't be a secret anymore. I really, I'm an animal guy too. Um, I actually worked at a zoo before coming to the garden and um, my favorite holiday place is the Serengeti in East Africa. So I think this year when I took a group, it was my um, 15th time there. So, so my single biggest cheerleader is my partner, Craig. And Craig and I um, have been together 26 years. He's a dean at ASU. So I try to be, I hope I'm his biggest cheerleader too. So there's good mutuality there. We have three children, three grandchildren. Um, they're a great source of inspiration um, and happiness. And we've got such an important mission, education, research, conservation, and exhibition of desert plant. So each day is really a matrix of working with those people for those causes. The two off the garden grounds that we're really proud of, and this is one of them, it's called Spaces of Opportunity. We're in South Phoenix now, um, and this is an 18 acre plot of land that once was used to, to grow food and crops. We're a garden, so we know how to grow plants, and that's our expertise. In our last strategic plan, we decided we wanted to go beyond the, the garden walls. And community gardening was one of the projects that was at the top of the list. So what we're doing is working with our partners here to turn what had been a food desert into a food oasis for the benefit of the community. So I love my work. I actually feel inspired by all the work and all the challenges that we have. And knowing there's so much to do gives me more energy rather than sapping my energy. So I think I really thrive on that high level of, of challenge and uh, opportunity to, to do things. Ken, congratulations and thank you for joining us today. For those of you at home, we were wearing masks just prior to this conversation. So, uh, we got a glimpse into the life of Ken Schutz before the pandemic. Uh, how have things been since? Well, very different. The work has been the same, um, so, but the mechanism for performing the work, mm -hmm. as is true for everybody, has changed. Yeah. So, I've become far more expert at Zooming, mm -hmm. among other things. <laughs> um, and we continue to do what we did um, in terms of planning, budget work, meeting three times a week with senior staff. Um, because we didn't have guests, the work related to that did slow down a bit, but that allowed us to go into contingency planning. So in work um, and in relationship with my family and my kids, that our kids that are on the East Coast, we Zoom and we make it work. Yeah. Um, and then with respect to travel, I had a nice year planned and we've, um, we've postponed all of those. So yeah. those have been our major adjustments. And it's always been fun to work at the garden. We have the good fortune of being successful. So there's been good momentum. These times are tough and it's hard to maintain morale. So leadership has also meant being honest and realistic, but also keeping the morale of our staff, our volunteers and our board and myself up so that we're performing optimally. Yeah, that's great. Um, so I know you're a big fan of conservation uh, and it means a lot to you. Uh, what's still on your bucket list when it comes to conservation and the garden? So conservation is a long-term effort. Um, believe it or not, our founders in 1939 were worried about the loss of habitat mm -hmm. and plant species. So that's how old this concern is. My 
my job, I think, is to pass on the work that we've done in terms of collecting endangered species so that the next generation of leaders can actually find land, restore land, reintroduce the species we have, and reclaim nature to make up for what we've lost. Yeah, that's great. What's, uh, what's your advice? We have a lot of leaders here, alumni, our network, uh, all willing and ready to be driven to do and, and get stuff done. Uh, what's your advice to them for people that want to make a difference so here in Arizona? Pick one or two things that you're really passionate about. Commit to them. Take the long-term yeah. view. I mean, in a year, you might get a little bit done, but think what you can do in 10 years. If you're, if you're certain this is your career path, think what you can do in your entire career. So just start. Um, I also think it's important um, to think about um, how you can help and not wait until you're asked, but actually to be proactive mm -hmm. in introducing yourself within your organization or outside your organization and saying, hey, I see this problem. I think I can help. I know I may not have the credentials. Uh, you may not have the budget, but can we try? And then if I deliver, perhaps I could move into this area for you. Mm -hmm. So don't be shy about promoting yourself in fulfillment of that greater cause. Leadership is an activity. We, we love Valley Leadership loves it. Leadership driven to do. Um, so now we're going to have some fun with Ken uh, and ask him some fun questions. These are all questions that I came up with. So uh, if you don't want to answer any of them, Ken, I won't. I won't feel bad. Uh, but let's start off by testing your Arizona um, history knowledge as well as the, the plant world. Uh, what is Arizona's state flower? Uh, that would be the saguaro bloom. Correct. Correct. Right. And our state plant. Tree or plant? Tree, correct, okay. tree. Because I think it sort of breaks down by plant Yes, yes. I don't think we have a the plant, state we tree have a tree. is the Palo Verde. Palo Verde, and then our state storm? Is the Haboob. The Haboob, dust storms, for those of you that are, many of you that are still new to Arizona. All right, um, are you a cactus man or a succulent man in audience? I believe there is a difference, you can Google yeah. it. But the doctor here will, will, will correct me if I'm wrong. So we, we have a, um, word at the garden called cactomaniac to describe uh. people like me. So I'm a cactomaniac, <laughs> right. um, but I, I also love all succulents, but my one true love is in the plant world is uh, cactus. And your favorite cactus? Favorite cactus is one called the creeping devil, um, mm. a ground growing <laughs> um, sinuous um, species among the first that we collected in 1940 in Baja, California. Oh, and wow. it's creeping because you plant it here and over 10 years, this part's died back and it's out there. And so it will always extend? Yep. Ugh, that does, it's, it's a most apt name. Um, is there a best kept secret to the garden? Yeah, the, I think the garden's best kept secret, and we do it intentionally, is how many very rare and valuable endangered species we have. They are on display to the public um, because it's easier to grow there in the ground than in our greenhouses, but we don't identify them. So mm -hmm. when you're walking by plants at the garden, you may be in the proximity of the last of five of a known species, wow. um, but you wouldn't you know wouldn't it because we're not going to tell you um, because sadly there are folks who um, poach cactus and we don't want to enable that. Wow. Wow. Um, what's your favorite uh, arts and culture place, space outside of the garden? I love museums. Of all the museums I've been to, there's one in Baltimore called the American Visionary Art Museum, which really, f the visionary part focuses on non-formally trained artists who create out of a need to heal or grow. Um, and some of the artworks that they, they create are just so personal and the stories behind them are so moving that I just love to see the piece and then read about the artist and his or her story. And mm -hmm. um, it's the museum that I've been most moved in um, by the art of all the ones I've ever visited. Um, so speaking of visiting places, uh, once we're out of this pandemic, where's the first place you're gonna go? Craig and I are gonna buy two plane tickets and hop on a plane to New York and see two of our three children okay. and all three of our granddaughters and hopefully our son will fly in from Boulder too okay. and we can all hang out together in the hang city. Out. Yeah, hopefully that's a, a springtime, springtime in New York. Well, we'll see, we'll, we'll hope. Um, and as we think about hope, what's a moment of gratitude you've had during this time? 
Yeah, I'm so grateful to the members of our staff un who, unlike me, haven't been working from home, but have been going to the garden every day since we closed to the public to care for the plants through this dreadful summer. Um, our rangers, our visitor um, services staff, um, and our facility staff that have kept the plants and the facility in tip-top shape so that when we reoke reopened on July 6, we were ready to go. There was no extra work that had to be done. I'm That's so great. grateful to them. Ken, again, thank you for being here and congratulations on being our 71st man of the year. We're now gonna get an opportunity to talk with our 71st woman of the year, Karen Taylor Robeson, who is president and founder of Arizona Strategies. I, um, I work out every day just just because it feels good. Um, I need to be healthy as a, as a mother of four. They keep me quite busy and then and you know I try and get an early start on the day. And I would much prefer to be outside. I mean we are so blessed to live in Arizona and Phoenix where we have these incredible the incredible mountain preserve, um, which is kind of, you know, in everyone's backyard. The one thing daily I can't live without is my family. Uh, there's no question. Good morning. I'm back. Again, you go, you outdo yourself every time. And I love birthdays. I, I can't imagine life without them. So my day job varies every day. Some days it's, it's really highlighted by uh, Board of Regents work, sometimes client work, sometimes my own development work. Um, so my clients take me all over the valley from, from the town of Superior to Apache Junction to Avondale to the city of Phoenix. Um, today I'll be going to the city of Phoenix, uh, working on a, a small neighborhood project. Uh, and then um, later this week, I'll spend most of my most of my week on Board of Regents matters over at Arizona State University. So we're standing in the, in the heart of Verado, which is a master plan community in Buckeye, Arizona. It's a very special place to me because it's one of the, the first projects I got to work on as a young attorney. I was only four years out of law school when, when this was was uh, thrown into my lap and I was told, you need to go annex this and, and get it zoned, get a development agreement, and oh, by the way, do it in the next nine months. One area that I spend an awful lot of time is in um, support of the military, um, civic education, civil discourse. And the most rewarding for me is, is to be a part of making our community uh, more vibrant, um, making our education system better, uh, a, a business environment where we can have quality jobs, um, you know, not only for my kids, but everybody's kids, just creating the future that we want. Garen, congratulations. Thank you. And thank you for being here. Uh, so we got a glimpse into your life pre-pandemic. How have things changed since then? Since then, I've, um, I've had the opportunity to spend more time with my, with my kids and my family. Uh, in the springtime when the weather here was just fabulous, yeah, we, yeah. we were able to spend a lot of time outside riding bikes and, and hiking and things that otherwise I just wouldn't have had time to do. Yeah, yeah. Um, so you've been engaging in civics since a very young age. Uh, why do you feel it's so important for people to be engaged in their community? I fundamentally believe because we live in a self-governing society, we all have an obligation to get involved and to give back. Um, you know, whether it's w through charity work or church or school or uh, politics, um, we really don't have the luxury of sitting on the sidelines. We should all be engaged in, in actively participating in our community. Karen, who is a leader uh, you've met along your leadership journey that you would uh, you look up to? Well, there's been so many great leaders in Arizona. We've got a, you know, for being a young state, we mm -hmm. have a, a, a long list of leaders from Carl Hayden to Bear Goldwater to Sandra O'Connor and many others. 
Uh, but for me, it was probably my father who spent a couple decades in public service, and, and I got to watch him from a very early age. I was about five years old, I think, when he, when he was first elected to the state legislature. So I was able to, to witness that you know, up close and, yeah, and yeah. every day in and, and the various aspects of, of the work that he did in the legislature and the Corporation Commission. Um, and so that was, he's probably the one that I, yeah. I personally look up to the most. Well, great, because we're going to, as part of our fun segment, uh, the fun questions I'll be asking Karen include one about your father, okay. so I look forward to asking you that. Um, what's still on your leadership bucket list? Oh, there's a lot of things I want to accomplish. I have decided I'm never going to retire. Yeah. You know, as long <laughs> as I'm, I, I have it in me, I'm going to continue to to try and give back to the community that's been so good to me. Um, but uh, education, you know, Arizona for many, many years, we were whatever, 48th or 49th mm -hmm. in every category you can think of. Um, we're not anymore. We've made a lot of progress, uh, but we're not where we need to be. We, yeah. you know, I want the state to be number one when it comes to education. Um, I've had the opportunity to, to be involved in education. I currently serve on the Arizona Board of Regents uh, and believe that, that everything really starts and ends with good education. And, and uh, we need to make sure that we have access to good education um, because it's not just for the individual, um, but it's for the community. It's right. for our economy. We need a well-educated population, in particular in a, an economy that is, is so technologically driven. Uh, we cannot just rely on what we've done in the past. We have to continue to move forward. And, and so I think that's at the top of my list, is really trying to, to lead on that issue. Great. Thank you uh, for that leadership, too. Uh, so we have many leaders uh, across our, our wide alumni network, um, all gearing up, ready to do things. Um, what's your advice or your call to action uh, to people who want to make a difference here in Arizona? Well, I think you just decide to do it. Wake up tomorrow and, and go for it. Whether it's you know leading your homeowners association or the you know church group or the mm -hmm. you know PTA, whatever it is, wake up tomorrow and decide you're going to do it. We all have it in us. We all have a responsibility. As I said earlier, we all have a responsibility to give back. Uh, and just just do it. Cool, thank you. <laughs> um, so now we're gonna have some fun questions that were uh, all created by me. So if you don't <laughs> wanna answer any of them, feel free, do not answer them. Um, you had mentioned your father before, and I know he was one of Mesa's, uh, one of the first to own a pharmacy in Mesa. Um, did you ever help yourself to a candy bar? Always. And I, what, was a, what was a favorite? My favorite was Reese's Peanut Butter Cups gotcha. to this day still, but uh, Butterfingers, Peanut M&Ms, anything in the peanut family. Peanut family. I, family. That's yeah, good. I had no peanut allergies. I, you, I love the peanut stuff. Were you the stalker of the candy bars? Uh, I was. I was. And I, you know, I, I took seriously my responsibility <laughs> of making sure the inventory was, was, was rotated. Always it, was always <laughs> where it needed to be. That's awesome. Right. Um, uh, we also know you're a, a hiker. Piestua or Piestua Peak or Camelback Mountain? Piestua. And because because my knees hurt when I come uh, down Camelback. <laughs> <laughs> Camelback is a little is a little tougher. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Uh, and staying on Arizona, um, what's your favorite place in Arizona? My favorite place in Arizona is definitely at home yeah. with my family. Um, but we are we are blessed with uh, a gorgeous state. You know where you can go from the desert to the forest to, you know, the Grand Canyon all yeah. in a day. Yeah. And speaking of the Grand Canyon, it's that that may be my favorite spot. It's just you know, beautiful, glorious, and it's in our backyard. Yeah, that's, that's absolutely right. Um, shout out to teachers. Uh, we have uh, teachers who have now had to pivot and do online, Zooms, all this sort of thing. Uh, thank you, um, one. And then what's, uh, who's your favorite teacher and why? My favorite teacher was Mrs. Lawrence. She was my sixth grade social studies teacher. Uh, she just instilled in me, you know, the uh, love of learning about our country and our government. Um, um, but not just me. I, I saw her really um, get my my classmates interested mm -hmm. and and involved. That's great. Yeah. So um, once we're returned, to, once we return to normal, which you know, twenty twenty five, twenty thirty, who knows when. Uh, What's the first place? You, where's, where's the first place you want to go? What's the first thing you want to do? First thing I want to do is be with a lot of people. I just want to be, you know, kind of back to normal where we could get together, whether it's a, a social group, a business mm -hmm. group, an, uh, an athletic uh, event, uh, just where you could go and watch other people and run into yeah. friends and and you know be normal again. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so fingers crossed for Man and Woman yes. 2021. Uh, hopefully in the fall at the latest, but we'll see. But that may be your opportunity and. 
Uh, we look forward for all the duties you have uh, handing over the reins to our next uh, man Thank and woman you. of the year, Thank 72nd. Um, what, uh, in this time of you know stress, challenges, everything else, uh, what's a moment of gratitude you've had in the last few months? Spending time, extra time with my family. Okay. That's definitely at the top of the list. Well, Karen, congratulations again. Thank, Thank you so you. much for being here. Uh, we're now going to hand it over to Michelle McGinty, president of the board of directors of Valley Leadership. That's her day job. And then on nights and weekends, she's president CEO of DRA Collective. Michelle? Thank you, Dave, and congratulations again to Karen and Ken. Now, I am honored to introduce Valley Leadership's first ever Person of the Decade Award. This once in a decade award honors the late Senator John McCain and will go on to recognize other once in a decade leaders and doers whose grit and determination in taking on and solving Arizona's most pressing issues mirror Valley Leadership's five principles of doing. Of building trust, having a team mindset, operating with integrity, putting Arizona first, and being driven to do. Senator McCain's life of service is the very epitome of VL's principles of doing and our commitment to cultivating leaders who work to get things done for Arizona. Our alumni recognize him as not only a true American, but a true Arizonan. We are grateful for his service and the lasting legacy he left on our great state. Before we welcome his son, Jack McCain, to the studio, let's watch this tribute to the late Senator from ABC News. John McCain was born August 29, 1936, at a naval base in the Panama Canal Zone. His father and grandfather, both named John, and both in service. Wartime commanders John McCain's fate was laid before him. I remember when my dad's friends would be over when I was very young and they'd say, what class is he going to be? Not, you know, is he going to the Naval Academy or not? What class would he be? He would attend the Naval Academy in Annapolis in the footsteps of his father and grandfather. He would graduate part of the class of 1958. Here, heading to flight school in Pensacola, Florida, he would later volunteer to drop bombs on targets in North Vietnam during the war. That's where the sound of the guns were, and we wanted to ride to it. It is what we train for and what our mission is. At 31 years old, aboard the aircraft carrier Oriskany, flying an A-4 Skyhawk on his 23rd run. Just as he released a bomb, an enemy missile takes a wing off his bomber. He ejects, breaking both his arms and one leg, his bomber washing ashore. McCain would land in a lake in the center of the city of Hanoi. The Vietnamese would pull him out of the water and capture him. They would stab him, beat him, and then take him to a prison camp, later known as the Hanoi Hilton. Filmed as a POW, he was asked his name. What is your name? Lieutenant Commander John McCain. Unable to use his hands, he had to be fed by his captors. His irreverence, a source of strength, to his fellow prisoners. How is your food? It's not like Paris. <laughs> I eat it. Deteriorating in strength and delirious with pain for months, the Vietnamese only treated his wounds after they realized he was the son of a famous admiral. I think you have a famous name. Yes. The Vietnamese would have an offer. They would tell him he could go home. They hoped it would be a PR coup for them, given how famous his family was. But McCain would refuse. He told them he didn't want to break the U.S. military code of conduct for POWs. The first man captured must be the first man out. I badly wanted to go home. I was tired and sick. McCain would stay another four years as a POW, half of that in solitary confinement. In 1973, 591 POWs were released and John McCain was one of them. Commander John McCain. A salute and home on American soil. Reunited with his family, deciding to serve his country in a new way. I'm announcing today my decision to become a candidate. For the Elected to the House in 1982 and to the Senate four years later. He would run for president in 2000 and again in 2008. Campaigning against then-Senator Barack Obama, McCain would do the unthinkable in today's politics. 
he defended his opponent. I can't trust Obama. I, I, I have read about him, and he's not, he's not, he's a, um, he's an Arab. He is not. No, 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 ma'am, no, ma'am. No, ma he's a, he's a, he's a decent family man, citizen that I just happen to have disagreements with on, on fundamental issues, and that's what this campaign is all about. He's not. Thank you. And it was a year ago he was diagnosed with a brain tumor, returning to the Senate floor just days after brain surgery, walking in to a standing ovation, casting that deciding thumbs-down vote on the effort to repeal Obamacare without a replacement. In one of his final public appearances, John McCain joining his daughter Megan. I love you so much. John McCain spent his final months with family, with friends, and reflecting in his autobiography on the power of humanity, the power of what we all have in common. Before I leave, I'd like to see our politics begin to return to the purposes and practices that distinguish our history from the history of other nations. I'd like to see us recover our sense that we are more alike than different. Jack, thank you for joining us today to accept this honor on your dad's behalf. I've meant to, mentioned to Jack that I shared many flights with his father in my old job. Leaving DC on Thursday nights, headed back to Phoenix with the entire Arizona delegation. I was always struck at how thoughtful he was. He was always reading something, waiting for the plane, but he would never refuse someone coming up to shake his hand. And once on the plane, he was always reading and thinking. Thoughtfulness and politics shouldn't be mutually exclusive. To the audience at home, please share your questions for Jack via the chat and we'll get to as many as we can. Jack, before we jump in, I wanna call attention to the actual Person of the Decade Award, which was created for your family by Luis David Valenzuela. He's an artisan in Tucson and a member of the Yoama tribe who is keeping traditional wood carving alive. He crafted this piece from cottonwood trees we received from the McCain Ranch in Cornville. Thank you to Sharon Harper, past woman of the year, for helping us get the wood. It's a handcrafted piece that features a deer dancer, the oldest traditional dancer of the Yoi Ma tribe, representing the spirit of the deer, blessing of nature and beauty of life. Thank you, Lewis, for such a wonderful piece. Let's get to the questions. This is a decisive, divisive time for our country. Your father found ways to build relationships, to listen, to forgive, what lessons can we take from that kind of leadership now? I think if you were to look back at my father's legacy, there would be a few notable, um, I think I've got an echo going on, <laughs> thanks to Zoom. Um, I think there'd be a, a few notable things that you would pick out. Um, the most important being civility, uh, the golden rule simply, um, treating others the way that you would wanna be treated. I think the second is approach everyone with humility. Uh, there is, you never can go wrong um, approaching somebody as another human being and approaching them as humbly as possible. Uh, being inquisitive, asking questions, getting to know people, sitting down with them face to face. Uh, I've always found inqui inquisitiveness is one of the most important aspects uh, any leader can have and trust. Um, you n cannot have leadership without trust. That's the fundamental uh, cornerstone of all leadership. And then something that my dad taught me, but that uh, I also learned myself, um, is that you can never hold somebody to a standard that you don't hold yourself to. Uh, probably one of the most important rules of any leadership, and especially military leadership. Uh, your father also loved our state and championed the Rio Reimagine project to steward our urban waterfront here in Phoenix. What sparked his passion for preservation and nature? So I, I think um, you can attribute that to a couple of things. The first one being he was obviously deprived of beauty for a portion of his life. And I think that that, um, that kind of lit more of a fire in him to seek out natural beauty. But one of his favorite leaders um, was Theodore Roosevelt. And he really spearheaded the American conservation movement. He helped found many, many national parks. Um, and in his view of the strenuous life, thought that being in and around 
nature um, is one of the most important things that you can do as a human being because an appreciation for natural beauty um, is something you just can't replace. Uh, and I think that his adopted home of Arizona uh, was perfect for him, um, especially when you think of the Grand Canyon, which is a place that he loved and we traveled to almost yearly when I was young. Um, I still remember hiking from the North Rim to the South Rim with him and watching him literally revel in the natural beauty of the canyon, despite the fact he'd probably seen it a hundred times in his life at that point. Um, so I think that that sums up his his uh, drive um, to help uh, conserve, preserve, and take care of uh, nature. Great. Um, your dad had a reputation for working across the aisle uh, and being willing to listen to ideas over politics, thoughtfulness. Uh, he's probably uh, famous for many things, but his, his famous thumbs down uh, spoke to that. Let's have a, a conversation about a, a piece of legislation. As we think about how we engage in conversations, discussions with our friends, neighbors, colleagues about the future of our state and the future of our country, what advice do you have? Um, first, always be willing to reach out. Uh, you, if, if one person doesn't make the effort to reach across the aisle or to find common ground, then you have no place with which to start. Um, so always, always being willing to reach out. And second, there is never anybody that is beneath your dignity. Um, I think that my father had a, an excellent example of that um, and that he always treated people as if they were his equal. Um, and I think that's one of his most important legacies is, is the, the sense of, um, of the dignity of all human beings. Um, there's a, an Af Afghan saying that I uh, picked up. I won't say it in Dari because my Dari is terrible right now, but uh, drop by drop, a river is made, which essentially means um, over time, small changes aggregate into big change. Um, and uh, the best place to start with aggregating great change is compromising, finding common ground and working together towards a common goal. So I, I know you're a, a relatively new father. Congratulations uh, to you and your wife. Thank you. Um, what's a piece of advice you're going to tell your son that your father told you? Uh, three things, actually. Um, the first being that life is our greatest adventure, uh, to seek out elements in life that provide adventure and, and enjoy it, uh, because life truly is uh, a wonderful adventure. The second is that nobody uh, is perfect. I think my father was very, very good at reinforcing this point with everybody around him that um, we, we are all human beings. We all have tempers, we all have bad days, we all have uh, human flaws. And not only are they things that we should understand, be self-aware of, um, but we should also be able to turn them into strengths. Um, and lastly, uh, his, his most important legacy to me um, and the advice he would give to anybody is uh, always serve a cause greater than your self-interest. You've probably heard him say that a thousand times, and I find myself saying it just as often, but uh, that's probably the best advice that you can give anybody. Absolutely. All right, we're going to take a couple of questions from the chat, the virtual crowd here from Stephanie. Uh, what is one wish your dad would have wanted for Arizona? At being um, part, and, sorry, I, and how can you be a part, how can we be a part of that chain? As you can see, I'm trying to read... Uh, my teleprompter poorly here. <laughs> I, I think um, that he would want to see Arizona, um, especially the youth in Arizona, be um, active citizens, to be engaged in civic life and to help make their state a better place, uh, to, to form it into the image that they, they believe it should be. So whether that entails service, whether that entails um, serving in public office, charity, anything, just inspiring as many Arizonans as possible to help better themselves and better their community. Great, from Michelle B, we have, what leadership quality do you admire most? <laughs> uh, I've had good leaders and I've had bad leaders uh, growing up. And when I look through, um, I'd like to read history a lot. So when I, I look through uh, history, I find tenacity uh, and, and bravery, the willingness to, to risk oneself um, as two aspects of leadership um, that are irreplaceable. So, um, yeah, I'd have to say uh, tenacity and bravery. Cool. Uh, one more here from Mary F. What principle of doing do we need now the most? And if you don't remember, building trust, Arizona first, uh, integrity, 
driven to do, and I'm going to get uh, really ridiculed for not knowing my, the, the, f the five there. I'm missing one. Pick one of those four, and what's your favorite? I, I think um, integrity, which goes right back to the idea of trust we, we talked about earlier. Um, that integrity is foundational to leadership. It's foundational to, um, to life. And I, I actually, um, I was a teacher at the Naval Academy for a little while, and we had a, a lot of conversation about the idea of integrity. What does it mean? I think there's a common quote thrown around that says, integrity is what you do when you believe nobody's looking. And um, I actually like to turn that on its head and say, integrity is what you do when absolutely everybody's looking because um, sometimes it's a lot harder to do the right thing when everyone is watching than it is to do the right thing um, in the shadows. So, and doing the right thing because it's the right thing to do. Great, all right, one more question here from Deborah L. How do we recover civility and honor in our country? <laughs> That's, um, that is a wide reaching question. Um, I, th I think going back to a couple of things we touched on already, the idea of being willing to reach out to somebody that may not necessarily see the world the same way you do. Um, just being willing to put out a hand helps restore civility uh, and it helps restore trust. Um, I think the concept of restoring honor is a, um, a difficult one because there's a lot of different forms of honor, whether it's personal honor, um, whether it's the, the honor of the state. But I'd say provided that you are living your, your life in a way that you can be proud of and um, helping to make your state uh, and your country and the world a better place, then um, you are absolutely on the right track to restoring honor. Great, thank you so much, Jack. We're, we're gonna finish with some fun questions uh, in the same vein that uh, I was able to pepper uh, Ken and Karen. Jack has seen most of these, uh, so we'll, we'll have some fun here. Um, you're a naval aviator and a big movie guy. I'm a big movie guy too. My uh, favorite naval aviator of all time, besides your dad, of course, uh, is Lieutenant Peach, Pete Mitchell, uh, call name Maverick. Who's a better pilot, Maverick or Iceman? I think given the McCain last name, it's pretty easy to figure out who I prefer. Um, but I was actually thinking about this last night and um, <laughs> I feel like Iceman is the type of pilot that would tell me that my PowerPoints are bad and that makes me a bad pilot. Um, whereas Pete Mitchell uh, has that kind of, that tenacity, that bravery we were talking about. And um, he's uh, my, my preferred movie naval aviator. Absolutely. Um, do you have a call sign? I do have a call sign. It's, uh, <laughs> it's Whopper. Whopper? Like the Burger King Whopper or the War Games Whopper? Like the Burger King Whopper. Okay. <laughs> Very cool. Um, I know you're also a big, a big James Bond fan. Who's your favorite 007? So I, I grew up watching um, Thunderball. Uh, was one of my dad's favorite Bond movies. We watched it all the time. Um, so I, I really like Sean Connery's Bond. Um, and overall, he's probably my favorite. But... My controversial take uh, is that I don't think that Timothy Dalton ever gets his due. If you're uh, going to cut a Bond out of central casting, it would probably look like Timothy Dalton. Um, so he may not have gotten the best screenplays, but I think he was a pretty good Bond. That's very much the, the, the serious Bond was, was Timothy yes. Dalton. Um, <laughs> yeah. um, favorite thing over COVID, you know, everybody's stuck inside. What have you binge watched on TV? Uh, so I've, I've been watched a few things. Um, actually, recently, my wife and I watched Tehran, um, which is excellent. If, if you haven't seen it, I think it's on Apple Plus. Uh, Tehran is, is very, very good. And um, a lot of it's in Farsi, so it helps out, you know, keep my language skills sharp. So worth watching. Uh, but if my dad were still around, um, I honestly think that I'd be watching a show called The Expanse with him. Um, it's a, a very uh, political intrigue uh, and warfare TV show with all sorts of factions in it. So um, I think you'd love it. Very cool. Well, again, Jack, congratulations and thank you for being with us today. We're honored to have had the opportunity to recognize your father um, and we appreciate you. So uh, let's send it back to Michelle McGinty. Thank you again, Jack, for joining us. What an inspirational evening. 
Great leaders make great places, and our state is better because of the contributions of all our honorees. That commitment to Arizona, to stepping up for what's right and finding solutions together is what we at Valley Leadership work to instill in our leaders. To build a stronger Arizona, it's going to take all of us, and we invite you to join us. Tell people about the impact Valley Leadership has had on you as an alumni. Come back and do a program yourself, or look for ways to get more engaged in the impact maker. Our past men and women of the year have been so impressed with our work, they have joined forces and pledged their support, ensuring anyone who is ready to lead can. But they've leveled a challenge for all of us. They are asking you, our Valley Leadership Network of alumni and friends, to join them in their generous donation. Your gift can unlock the potential of leaders and put that potential to work on some of our state's greatest challenges. That's why the entire Valley Leadership Board wanted to ask you to consider making a gift today. Support VL. Donate. At valleyleadership.org slash donate. Support VL. Donate. At valleyleadership.org slash donate. We have two ways you can support Valley Leadership's work, through our scholarship fund or the work of our impact maker. And it's easy. Please donate directly from the text you just received or at valleyleadership.org slash donate. Thank you again for your support. Together, we are ensuring we can empower and mobilize more leaders to strengthen Arizona. Now, I'd like to send it back to Dave. Thank you, Michelle, and the entire Valley Leadership Board of Directors. Congratulations again to Ken and Karen. Jack, thank you for joining us to celebrate the legacy your father has left in Arizona and beyond, and thank you all for your leadership. I also want to thank our staff and supporters who made tonight possible. Michelle, Bailey, Marcus, Pearl, and our newest member of the team, Sarah. You've all done tremendous work this past year, and I appreciate it. Also, special thanks to our 70th annual, 70th annual honorees, Colleen Jennings Rogensock and John Graham for all your duties through the past year. Those duties are now yours, Karen and Ken. And finally, I wanna thank all of our sponsors for su supporting this event. We host events like this, not just to inspire you, but to inspire you to think about how you can make a difference and act. Leadership is an activity, not a title. We will be sharing more opportunities to engage with us through Impact Maker. If you're looking for ways to continue to refine your leadership skills, we will have new opportunities coming in 2021, fingers crossed. And if you haven't already, there's still time to give. As you can see, so many of our friends and past men and women of the year have already given, and we thank them very much for their support. Also, when you give $150 or more, you'll get a State 48 branded t-shirt. You can donate at valleyleadership.org slash donate. Stay well, stay safe. We can't wait to see you again in person soon. Have a good night.